Right, well, hello everyone, and welcome to the 19th Stephen Roskill Memorial Lecture. I'm Alan Packwood, and I'm lucky enough to be the director of the Archive Centre, and I'm going to be acting as sort of master of ceremonies for, for this evening. Um, first of all, thank you all so much for coming on this beautiful summer evening. And for those of you who are watching online, um, thank you all very much for staying inside on this beautiful summer evening. Um, I have to tell you, of course, that the fire exits are located at the side and at the, at the back of the hall. Um, and in the unlikely event that we have an alarm, the staff will direct you to the relevant fire assembly point. On a more positive note, you're all invited to drinks afterwards in the main college bar. And some of us will then be going on from there to dine in the main dining hall. Um, for those of you who are dining, if you've left coats in seminar room one here, those will be moved to the main college concourse going up to the, the Porter's Lodge um, during the course of the meal. Um, the other thing to say, of course, is that we are recording this lecture. Indeed, we're also live streaming it. So if you don't want to appear on film, um, it's probably going to be better not to ask a question. Um, but we want you to ask questions. And for those of you um, um, watching online, you'll be able to use the Zoom Q&A function. But to get to the questions, we need to have a lecture. And to introduce our speaker and our subject this evening, I'm delighted to call to the stage our master, Professor Dame Feeney Donald. Thank you very much, Alan, and welcome to you all. Um, I'm so glad we could lay on some decent weather for you, and several members of the Roskill family have already remarked that because this event is being held in the summer, unusually, uh, they can actually see the site. So it is a very beautiful site, and I hope you had a bit of time to look around. So we have several generations and multiple branches of the Ruskell family here. And let me say to them, your support for the college, the Churchill Archive Centre, and especially this lecture over the years, has been truly inspiring, and it's always a pleasure to welcome you back. There's been a slight hiatus, but... Now, our last Roskill lecture was in February 2020, if you can cast your mind back to the distant time. And it is with particular sorrow that we note the passing of Mary Caro, one of the Roskill daughters, during the pandemic. She was at that last dinner, and she was always great company uh, and a fun presence at these gatherings, and we will miss her company. Now, the Roskill Lecture has been taking place since January 1985, when Lord Carrington gave the address during his time as Secretary General of NATO. The lecture exists to honour the memory of Captain Stephen Roskill, the celebrated naval historian, who was a senior research fellow of this college from 1961, and who played a key role in establishing our Churchill Archive Centre. The lecture was the brainchild of the then keeper of the archive, so a predecessor of Alan, Corelli Barnett, who I believe is watching online today. Now, this Roskill lecture is notable for a number of firsts. It's the first time it's been held in the summer, and this is entirely due to COVID. And, I mean, we originally hoped to do it in February at the usual timing, but, in fact, our speaker would have been unable to travel here from South Africa at that time. We were hoping that the summer might make it travel easier for everyone and a long summer evening being preferable to a cold short winter one. And I can hear from the, the sort of murmurs in the room that yes, we know there is a rail strike on. So a special thank you for all of you who've braved coming up here, um, whether you've braved the train, which seems particularly brave, particularly if you want to get back there um, early this week, um, but also those who've driven, because I'm sure the traffic is heavier than usual. And some of you, of course, could have come by bus in a very sustainable way. Shouldn't forget that. Um, it's also the first time the lecture has been simultaneously streamed, 
So hello to all of you watching from home. Um, sometimes when we have hybrid meetings in this hall, I can see everyone on the screen now, but this time they're totally anonymous, but welcome all the same. Um, and that of course extends to any who are watching from overseas. Um, and as Alan said, we will be making this lecture available in due course on the college website. But thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, this is the first Roskill lecture to be given by an alumnus of the college. So it's a great pleasure to welcome back Professor Joe Bloaton Deberley, Chairman of the Nelson Mandela Foundation and the Mandela Rhodes Foundation. Now, Najiblo outranks me. I'm only a master. He is the Chancellor of a university, the University of Johannesburg, and is the former Vice Chancellor and Principal of both the University of Cape Town and the University of the North in Savenga. He made his name as a writer of fiction and is a winner of the NOMA, Africa's highest literary award. His works include Fools and Other Stories, The Cry of Winnie Mandela, and Fine Lines from the Box. And he tells me he is now writing a book about boxing. Um, so slight change of focus there. Um, and we look forward to seeing that in due course. As a student here, he was the recipient of the college's first South African bursary, a bursary that is still going strong. And he is now an honorary fellow, proof, if it were needed, of the power of that scheme of the bursary. Professor Ndebele has over three decades of experience in senior leadership roles in higher education and public life in South Africa. He's part of the generation that has reshaped his country post-apartheid, and I know that we're going to gain much from his insights on the state of our world today. We've all been locked down in these last two years. We've all experienced something of what it is to lose freedom. So it seems appropriate that the title of today's talk is Prisons Without Walls, Reimagining the Global Community in the Time of COVID-19. Professor Ndebele. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Donald, for your kind words of introduction. Um, um, I have remarked to two of my friends that uh, the last time I was on this stage was a, a, as, a, as a performer in a play that had been uh, produced by uh, Tim Cribb and uh, I said to Alex when she was, Alan, when he was taking me around, I said, this, this place looked much, much bigger the last time I was here. So it, it, some, for some reason, it, it certainly has not shrunk, but I have a perspective of it as being smaller now. But it's so wonderful to be back at, at my college uh, to share some reflections on, the, on, on this theme uh, reimagining anything for for the future um, is not an easy thing because it involves having to grapple with very very uh, difficult issues. Uh, some some uh, take a lot of of courage to actually articulate, but it's a task that we all have to to undertake at some point in our lives. And the entire world is going through so much right now that some events could not have been imagined when in early 2021, when uh, uh, I was sent the invitation to come and, and, and speak. And so in this uh, global unfolding, where to begin, and where to end. It then occurred to me that something like a personal story uh, could help me ease myself into my thoughts. In it, this story, the personal and the public seem to converge intuitively with some resonance. The story I tell took place in Chatterston location, 
where I grew up after my family moved from Western Native Township in Johannesburg when I was an infant. The location uh, was and still is a satellite black settlement whose minimalistic design, like countless others like it in the country, was for the sole purpose of supplying black labor to the white mining town of Niger, just three miles away. The town and its location were and are at the easternmost edge of the Gold Reef, whose extreme western end was the mining town of Randfontein, to the west of Johannesburg, with uh, Johannesburg, the big metropolis, somewhere right in the middle. That 70 mile stretch of Gold Reef was critical to the British Empire. It yielded great riches in gold and other minerals to the center of the empire in England. Stones from the Cullinan diamond, the product of nature named after a human on whose mine it was found just north of the coal reef are among the crown jewels on the, of the British monarchy. But let me drop the attractions of big history and tell my story. I was alone at home when the incident that left a very deep mark uh, on my sense of self occurred on a bitterly cold South African midwinter year uh, or day. It could have been in June or July of uh, 1968. I had made a very good fire in the yellow paneled Ellis Deluxe stove, which those of, of my age present may, may remember. On that day, I had vowed to emulate my father and learn how to type. I always thought he was an, a wizard at it. I was rattling away with increasing confidence on his old typewriter when there was a knock on the door. But whoever was out there did not wait to be let in, as was the custom in the location. Two white men barged in through the unlocked door, took a deep, a brief glance at me while absorbed in the drift of an ongoing conversation between them in Afrikaans. The images reflected on their faces and the language of their bodies instantly made it clear to my 20-year-old mind what environment I had just got into. These men had entered a dwelling, their body language told me, to which they felt entitled. Instinctively, I responded to their intrusion with a subtle protest of my own. I remained seated, denying them in my mind the learned, the learned civilities of, grow, of growing up in my community where a young person would stand up when adults walked in. The white man who led the charge wore khaki shorts with matching shirt sleeves rolled up, fawn socks stretched up over his ankles and calves to just under the knees, and then folded downwards once from the top end. I had seen many Afrikaner men attired in this manner, and some British ones as well in Eswatini, 
then the British protectorate of Swaziland. Thus attired, they were a visual symbol of white men at work. On that day, the picture was rounded up by a clipboard with paper in the leading man's left hand and a pencil in the other. His companion, looking a little older than the fellow intruder he followed, wore a suit and tie. The two men simply continued with their conversation as if I didn't exist. I was later to learn from my mother that the clipboard man was what was called the superintendent of the location. What are we doing here? Uh, I'm trying, I wish I was Trevor Noah here to uh, get the accent right. But the superintendent asked, uh, surveying over my head, everything on the table before me. The centerpieces being the typewriter and the typing manual just to my right. He leaned over so closely, I can still feel to this day the passing puff of his breath on the back of my neck. In an environment I felt to be hostile, that puff of breath was repulsive. It urged me to want to say, can't you see what I'm doing? But I didn't. By then I had learned to choose the form and timing of my battles with white people. So it would do for now that I hadn't stood up for them, even if I was sure they were almost ignorant, certainly ignorant of there being any civilities of that nature. Uh, among the species of people they called natives. Ah, he said, learning to type, he exclaimed, glancing around and writing on the clipboard. But his rhetorical finding was directed at the other man rather than at me in what I interpreted to be a sharing of condescension. At the same time, it underscored the relationship between the two of them. The superintendent seemed to earn the approval of the man he appeared to be taking on a tour of the location. After a brief silence of cursory glances around the, the kitchen, and the superintendent declared, Gombase. Gombase means uh, kitchen in Afrikaans. So they nodded as they walked out of the kitchen and saw themselves in and out of the rooms in the rest of our four-roomed house. While I flustered, I remained seated in the kitchen as the intruders made an unwelcome tour of my home. Since I could hear their voices as they went from room to room, I knew they were returning to the kitchen when their voices rose, not because they spoke louder, but because the acoustics of the passage projected their voices towards the kitchen, which they re-entered, still in earnest conversation and note-taking. They passed behind me, and walked out, leaving me gaping at the open door, the head and closed behind them, trying to, left me trying to take in what had just happened and what was the meaning of it all. So I sat there, drawing some comfort from a position that offered something as protective as a fetal enclosure must be. Everything before me was bled, the table, the typing manual, the typewriter, and the paper in on which I had typed the letters, Q-W-E-R-T-Y, endlessly. 
It was the freezing from the outside surging into the kitchen that forced me from my chair, finally, to shut the door. Now, Father Trevor Huddleston is a British member of the Anglican community of the resurrection, left Merfield for South Africa, where he would be the parish priest of the Christ of the of Christ the King Anglican Church of Sophia Town, a black community that was to Johannesburg as Harlem was to New York. Father Huddleston came to be highly cherished in the memory of black South Africans. He loved his parish, its congregants, and the people of Sophia Town into which he easily integrated. I think it came from the manner in which he practiced his ministry. And Sophia Town loved him back. He was always there in their lives, in times of joy and travel, so much so that he, 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 he was, felt so much at home among his parishioners and the entire community of Sophia Town that at some point he chose to become a citizen of South Africa. I tend to him to give us a good entry into the subject of prisons without walls. And it helps to put into perspective the story I have just told you. Part of the meaning White South Africa's attitude to, part of the meaning, white South Africa's attitude to Africans, he writes, is revealed in the word location. In America, it generally has reference to part of the, le of the technique of the cinema industry. A film is made on location in order to give it the genuine flavor and atmosphere required of the story. But everywhere else in the world, so far as I know, the word means just a place, a prescribed area. That is why no doubt it was chosen by the European when he decided that the African must have somewhere to live when he came to work in the towns and cities of his own country. He could not live in a suburb. He could not live in a village. He could not live in the residential area of the town itself. He could only work in those places. And because he is an abstraction, a native, he must have an abstraction for his home, a location, in fact, a place to be in for so long as his presence is necessary and desirable to his European boss. End of quote. British author Alex Renton, in his recent book, Bloody Legacy, Reckoning with the Family's Story of Enslavement, displayed a deep insight into how the British treatment of slaves in the Caribbean could be a template for the nature of the South African location and its relationship to its white town. As Rentin read through his family papers, primary sources for his book, he came to realize, he writes, that my ancestors were indeed plantation owners of the British slave colonies, farmers of human beings. Instantly, I recognized what he meant. Because when the superintendent barged into my home 
with the guest he appeared to be showing around, they were on an inspection tour of their municipal farm of human livestock. I was a part of that livestock. The superintendent, farm manager of his location, wielded enormous power over his livestock of people. The South, the South African location, more particularly, no more popularly known today as a township, was a, 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 util, a, a, a utilitarian place built for purpose of controlled confinement. But the essence of such confinement is that it is invisible. You don't see the power that hovers over you. You may, you may intuit it sometimes, but you don't, you don't see it. It is woven into the location as a dormitory settlement with very basic housing, a water tap in each street, so you, go, you have to go out of the house to go to, to get your water, the bucket toilet system, and one of the few tarred streets was a, a, a bus route to take workers easily in and out, in the, uh, out of the location to work and then back to come and rest in the evening. So because location, locations are situated out of sight of the white settlement known as town, the word carries a special connotation in South Africa. Town is where you go, if you are black, to work in white people's homes, businesses, factories, municipal or government institutions. On Saturdays, you went to town to do your shopping. While there, and you happen to run afoul of the law, you could be put behind bars in a world prison where the reality of confinement was concretely visible and evoked the real sense of being punished. In my growing up days, a white man in town could push you off the pavement on an impulse and move on as if nothing has happened. Take a look at your imagination. The nine in the nine at the Niger, Niger post office, and you are black. You could stand in a long queue and be deliberately ignored by the white postal staff, even though the white side of the post office was completely empty. This behavior actually made little sense since almost all the black people in the queue on the other side were at the post office on white people's business. It is, it is conceivable that back in their homes after work, the white post, postal staff might even share some jokes about how they made the kefirs wait for a long time before serving them. I guess everybody would be happy that they had done some of that behavior. This is the kind of banality of prejudice that gets passed on from one generation to another at different levels in the white, white society. I guess today when I look at the relationships between Europe and the rest of the world, Africa, I see a little bit of this. The racist gene showed up recently when Arab African and Asian students trying to flee war in Ukraine uh, were denied exit from Ukraine and denied entry into Poland. It boggles the mind. But that's how it, it has been in history. At night, life in the location was a totally different place. After its relative emptiness during the day, 
it teemed with people back home to be themselves after having shared the day's performance or being servile at work. It became a place of resistance to something external to itself, but in a manner not overtly political. And I will tell you what I mean through an anecdote following the strange intrusion of the superintendent into my home. It had to do with how my mother reacted to my hurt and my silent protest in response to the superintendent's visitation, a violation of, uh, of her home. I thought I had impressed her with my passive resistance, but after a brief silence of listening to my story, she said, uh, it's more effective in, in my language, Firstly, is Ogokala, but firstly, you should have shown some respect, she said. And then, more devastatingly, she said, the man was only doing his job. I was, of course, deflated and totally confused, as I had expected some form of praise. S South African academic Jacob Zlamini in his book Nat Native Nostalgia made me think through my mother's reaction. When my mother chided me for disrespect, she was not expressing approval of the superintendent's behavior. She was referring to and affirming in a natural kind of way the African ways in which kinship between people is invoked even when they are not related by blood. Everybody calls everybody brother or a sister or, 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 or whatever. And, and it, it is a, a, in the signaling of affinity that relationships become possible among otherwise strangers. And these are the foundations of the communal life that holds people together in much of Africa, about mutuality, about deportment, about respect for self and others. And that is when the Dutch and the British arrived and enforced the commodity the commoditization of people. Turn everyone into a worker. They hit at the core of African social life. But that social order was weakened rather than destroyed. The resilient elements of it enabled the people of the location to survive every horror thrown at them the location, and despite the racist oppression, Jacob Flamini writes, in the location were bonds of reciprocity, of mutual obligation, of social capital that made it possible for millions to imagine a world without apartheid, long before apartheid was finally defeated. In a profound, seemingly non-political way, steeped in the resilient socio-cultural po politics of the currents of live life, I now think that my mother was saying to me was, let the Europeans be the savages they say you are. Don't ever emulate them or you lose yourself. And so my experience with the superintendent was to be the first time I intuited the nature of the relationship between my community of Charterston location and the invisible walls that surrounded it and the politics behind those walls that were personified in the superintendent as farm manager. And so 
Every evening was a time, therefore, of, of regrouping, of coming together. I think also that that coming together uh, led to a kind of a self-organized uh, community that was relatively peaceful and, and had a sense of self. It evolved informally. But such self-organizing could be double-edged. On the one hand, it could be interpreted by the white municipality as a measure of its success in managing the location into orderly natives, as invisible as I was to the, the superintendent and his guest. On the other hand, invisibility to the municipality could lead to the greater levels of self-awareness as it did in my case. In being rendered invisible, I began to wonder who I was and how do I become, how do I re-experience the world from, from what I have just ex experienced. Depending on the options available to you, you uh, either acquiesce or you resist. And much of the cross-generational social psychology of people of the location could either therefore promote or impede new ways of self-perception, even as citizens of a relatively new democracy today. I now, I'm now able to look back from a wider, an ever widening perspective. To see that depersonalization I experienced in my home, in the context of the, location, of the location, as a condition with a much larger dimension. I got to recognize and discern this larger dimension in my first encounter with British rule as a student at St. Christopher's High School in an Anglican school for, primary, for, for, for primarily for boys in Eswatini. The vast majority of us boys came from different parts of South Africa, sent there by our parents as educational refugees to avoid the newly introduced system of apartheid of education, which was designed called Bantu education, designed uh, specially for black people to, so that they cannot rise beyond certain levels of training and, and, and never become more than what the, they are destined uh, to be. This is what Father Harleston called education for, for servitude. Many of our parents sent us over there to escape from this situation. Now, in June of 1963, five years before my drama with the superintendent, the first battalion of the Scottish Gordon Highlanders was swiftly flown in from Kenya to quell a strike for more wages by workers of the Havelock asbestos mine. The strike triggered sympathy strikes in other parts of Swaziland. The students at the boarding school, and the vast majority of us being South Africans, with an active political awareness, not only in relation to the struggle against apartheid, but also aware of the anti-colonial struggles in other parts of the world, sympathized with the striking workers. The Nguane National Liberatory Congress, led by one Dr. Ambrose Suane, supported the workers' cause. The support included what he wrote to the United Nations, a call to the United Nations and to independent African states to protect them against what he called British high-handed methods aimed at suppressing 
the voicing of grievances of oppression by the people of Swaziland. As I contemplated my experience with the superintendent, it occurred to me that the Swazi workers had existentially far more immediate and difficult choices to make than I ever could have imagined. Who they were as a people and their bodies were exposed to life or death with severe consequences for the choices that they took. By force of arms, their capture within a colony was made real through the threat of violence and death. The, the mine they worked for with a military force and the British government in London behind it would continue then to pay the lowest wages possible under conditions of work they would never contemplate for their own people and end the British a disproportionate financial benefit. Some upset parliamentarians in London, God, God bless them, objected to the use of the British Army to settle labor disputes. As is the case in the United Kingdom right now, the government got away on very flimsy excuses. The line had been drawn but for the workers Go back to work or be killed. There had, there, where I had been erased as a person into an object, the Swazi workers were erased as a people by their employers and turned into objects, defense and, and defenseless. Defenseless and as shooting targets for the British Army. On the one hand was one black boy at home in a South African location. On the other, thousands of black beings in an entire country, one among many others across the continent, erased as humans, not worthy to be negotiated with. Both the personal and the collective shared one fate and it was this, what was required of them to do for others had far more value to those that took advantage of them than who they were as human beings. This is the critical part of the historical leg legacy of the relationship between Europe, Britain in this case, and Africa. Perhaps the last word on the breaking of the Swazi mine workers strike by the British Army must go to Lieutenant Colonel Charles Napier, who commanded the Gordon Highlanders. On landing in Swaziland from Kenya, he told the waiting press at the time, this is a showing flag mission. I do not know how long we shall be staying. I hope it, it will be long enough to make it worthwhile. So what happened to me and to the striking workers represents two dimensions, as I said, of prisons without walls. And I'd like to move on to say, to, the, uh, as, uh, to develop a, a, a different, another angle here. A past, whatever happens has happened and it was in the past. In their separate ways, in their respective possessions, the European powers had one thing in common, to enhance nationalistic economic competitiveness by creating and administering an infrastructure of roads, airports, harbors, and corralled labor, all orientated towards extraction and the ex export of raw materials to Europe, which have made Europe enormously wealthy as it is today. There was something else in common, and it is starkly captured for me at the end of the, 
Austra Austrian, Australian movie, Rabbit Proof Fence. In the movie, an official of the Western Australian government who had to implement a policy to capture mixed race Aboriginal children and bring them up as domestic servants for white Australians has failed to bring back two of the three girls who had escaped. He dictates a letter to report his failure. And this is what he says. We have an uphill battle with these people, especially the bush natives who have to be protected against themselves. If only they could understand what we are trying to do for them. The declared intention to do good for the natives by all the colonizers, practically, were more often than not regularly contradicted by their brutal actions, ensuring that they could never be trusted by those they sought to civilize through cruelties of care. It should be clear by now that what I'm trying to understand partly, is how it is that the European world of today can live comfortably in the 21st century with the histories of contradictory sides of itself. On the one hand, of the, on the one side of the coin, the mission of civilizing benevolence. On the other side is the manifest brutalities which Europe subjected other parts of the world who did not look like them and whose wounds are still visible. My personal experience in the South African location is one I share with nations and continents turned into global prisons without walls. To what extent are Europeans today conscious of their of their moral, of, of their, uh, sorry, uh, conscious of the moral contradiction integral to their history. To what extent would they consider such contradiction sustainable in a world so intricately connected? You can't change the past, says Sergeyov, as quoted by Alex Renton, but you can change its consequences. It seems to me that such an awareness together with the decisive end of colonial times might provide some basis for a new global conversation to alter the consequences of a past that cannot be changed. At the time I received my invitation to speak tonight, we were into our ninth month of COVID lockdown in, in, in South Africa. Seven months earlier, George Floyd was murdered in Minnesota, in the United States, before billions of global eyes. The witnesses were a global community of millions of Europeans and billions of people of the world to whom the fate of Floyd was a part of their own experience, histories. I was inspired by the global outrage against racism that spread across the world at the time. As memorials to enslavers tumbled and monuments and symbols which glorified European colonialism around the world were defaced, I recalled the anti-apartheid movement, which also became a global movement of solidarity with South Africans struggling against apartheid. The movement grew hugely in the campaign for Nelson Mandela to be released. In fact, I think we were re reminiscing not too long ago that uh, 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 the, this college in, the, in, 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 in starting the scholarship was part and parcel of the anti-apartheid anti movement that uh, was, was, was very strong at the time in many countries, particularly in the United Kingdom. 
global awareness went uh, with global action, as we could see. I believe that in times in which we live in times in which humanity finds itself, um, these times represent a potentially evolutionary moment in the growth and maturation of the human moral sensibility across the world. It is what is at stake is in fact the self-annihilation of the human species. We have destroyed so much of the natural environment and its complex ecosystems. And now seem poised, poised to throw nuclear weapons at one another. But a moment of pessimism might also be a moment of great creativity. Away from the inventing of weapons for more and more devastation towards an understanding of one another far more deeply and more intimately as human beings. COVID-19 came was a great leveler, led to a great discussion about being human in the world because we all of us were under attack by something we did not see, we couldn't see. And so we shared the threat. We shared the fear that all human beings have. Unfortunately, the triumph in the speedy development of life-saving vaccines did not last. The availability and distribution of vaccines soon showed up the fault lines of global history that I've just been talking about. Technologically advanced, wealthy nations of the world showed little compassion towards those that paid a huge price for their many successes. It went under the name of vaccine nationalism, a phenomenon which occurs when governments sign agreements with pharmaceutical manufacturers to supply their own populations with vaccines ahead of them of them becoming available to other countries. I was later to learn that the impact of these events reached Churchill College. I watched from the website, uh, the self-scrutiny of unexamined aspects of the college's institutional sense of self. I felt it felt just right that my college was confronting the full legacy of the person after whom it was named. A world figure who nevertheless believed in the supremacy of Europeans, the Aryan stock whose duty it was, he said, that was the, to use the power of the modern nation to kill savages, especially those filled with ideas. The memory of my mother got me asking, is the killing of savages by the modern nation? In the killing of savages by the modern nation, who were the savages? Those killed or those doing the killing? More than being a grateful recipient of the Churchill College bus bursary, I would love to be a part of a fuller and richer story of understanding of how such a question might be answered. Certainly, having been a student at Churchill College has made Churchill, the person, a part of me. Certainly, uh, uh, equally so, I have become a part of his commemoration. Um, so Winston Churchill is a fact of history who rightfully earned the gratitude of a nation when he led it successfully against German aggression. It is also a fact of history that the British electorate did not elect him prime minister 
after his leadership of the country in World War II. What did the electorate sense which led to their decision? But history's effects project forward to future generations and are always therefore present right now. One facet of that presence is that a university of Cambridge College named after him. That fact would make the college one of the resonances of Churchill's historic presence, which imbues the college with accreditations of commemoration. But such accreditations may and often do come with pitfalls, and certainly Churchill's attitudes towards those in the world who are not white is one such pitfall. Can the college, the, the college can choose to either accept the pitfall as an indelible historical fact and then either find justifications for it or engage in a robust critique, critique of it. How does the college in its self-definition react to the global outrage against racism in the world in the wake of public, the public murder of George Floyd. Was George Floyd a savage who deserved his end? What the world saw was something else. They saw a human being pining for his mother. They saw a human being begging for life-giving air that belongs to all of us. I asked this question about George Floyd with a provocative intentionality. What can indeed, we can indeed accept that Churchill was a product of his times. Those times will need to be spelled out in their full starkness, not only at the college, but also in the schools, the universities, in an array of cultural institutions in the United Kingdom which shape opinion and the national sense of self that are passed from one generation to another. The deeper question for the college, from my, from my point of view, is what are the times in which the college, named after Churchill, is itself a product of? After all, the essence of an institution need not be reducible to its unexamined name when there are strong moral grounds for its examination. It is possible that upon examination, the name itself can become the very source of the college's search for its contemporary essence. The college that does not shy away from history, the history of its name, might just become the richer for it. It is again such a background that I make the observation that oppressed people around the world tend to display a clearer, more genuine, and sharper moral sensibility for justice and fairness, equality, and a greater sense of human community where those things don't exist. So from the ghettos of the United States and from the locations of South Africa, two voices among others confirm my observation. The first one is African-American Nicole Hannah Jones. Hannah Jones writes, we were once told by virtue of our bondage that we could never be American. But it was by virtue of our bondage that we became the most American of all. In other words, African Americans fought for the United States to preach what it, to, 
to do what it, 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 it only preached. From South Africa, Tembega Ngogai Tobi, an advocate of the South African Supreme Court in his book, The Land is Ours, South Africa's first black lawyers in the birth of constitutionalism, tells the story of how South Africa's first black lawyers trained in the United States, trained in the United Kingdom, became pathfinding lawyers who through their activism, activism for justice and fairness, through thought and visual, they visualized the necessity for constitutionality and the Bill of Rights. Their foundational work is today enshrined uh, in the South African constitution, much lauded around the world. And in this way, they enabled black South African to use Nicole Jones's words to become the most South African of all. As I draw close to my address, I'd like to invite us then to be fully present at this moment with so much unfolding before our eyes. On the 21st of March this year, President Biden addressed top American chief executive officers at the business round table uh, in uh, White House and, uh, the, and reportedly made off the, off the cuff remarks to this effect. Now, he said, among other things, it is time when things are shifting, there's going to be a new world, world order out there and we've got to lead it. And we have got to unite the rest of the free world in doing it. Russia's invasion of Ukraine had been underway for just and a month. Unfortunately, President Biden did not specify the characteristics of this world order, except that he and the American oligarchs in business and government would lead it and by implication be its beneficiaries. He also did not specify what part of the world constituted the free world and which did not. By not doing so, I submit he takes us back to the Cold War. He, he is, came uh, across as a call for the united free world, which one can only guess could be made up of the United States, the United Kingdom, the European Union, their collective instrument of war, NATO. It is these countries and coalitions that seem destined to participate in achieving this new world order. Then the entire world will be freed by the free world. With the best will in the world, I do not think that President Biden's imagination, in his imagination, Africa features as a free world, certainly not Russia, not China, certainly uh, not a great deal of Asia, the Middle East, South America, and many other countries who together constitute 85% of the world's population. All of them seem invisible to, Biden, to Biden's free world, who will be the superintendents of the world, who struggle to see others for who, or for who they are, not notions of who they wish them to be. A unique opportunity has arisen for Europe, if it cares for its, its sovereignty, to learn from those whose freedom was taken away, appreciating its value and had to fight back for it. Europeans do not have to be black to be real or met metaphorically enslaved peasants of another country. 
their whiteness will not save them from the tyrannies of superpowerism. There is little sign that there is a collective political wisdom to which NATO is accountable. That is visionary. The world as we know it seems to me exposed to the gravest dangers that do not indeed call, that do call for a new world order, but not the undefined one proclaimed only by the United States. There's more of us in the world who are ready to make it a better world than it is today. There's a lot of wisdom ar around in the world to make it so. There's a lot of desire for us to become a better world than we have ever been. And the prospects that we can are there because there's a much that we have accumulated as a human species over thousands of years to get us to where we want to be. And it is here that I thank the college for the opportunity it gave me to share my thoughts with you tonight. Thank you very much. Right. Well, um, Professor Ndebele, thank you very much for a wonderful combination of the personal, the historical, the analytical, and the challenging. Um, talk, of course, extremely relevant to discussions that have been taking place here within college and more widely within the university and within British society. And I'm sure we're going to have many questions, potentially. We don't actually have very much time. Um, so if you have a question, can I ask you to raise your hand if you're in the room or to use the Zoom Q&A if you're online and then to wait for the roving mic to come to you. Um, if you can give your name and if you can keep your remarks and your questions um, short and to the point, that would be hugely appreciated. Um, so do we have a first question um, up here on this side with the white shirt? Thank you, Professor Ndebele. Um, my question goes to, you speak of historical legacies and how we can confront them, and there's a sense in which some of these things have happened in the past. But my question goes to what is currently happening, particularly in the Francophone world in Africa, where you hear that the French actually take almost 80% of um, most of the countries that are in the French pact. Uh, and this is not history, this is something that is currently happening. And how does the world sort of confront those realities? I, I, I think uh, uh, my, my, my response is actually assisted by uh, a New York Times article I read uh, about two or three days ago, uh, which uh, is an extensive uh, a product of an extensive research done in in the relationship between France and Haiti. And you remember that Haiti was the one country of slaves that freed themselves. And, and then France uh, tried successfully eventually to get them the, 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 to, to, to colonize the country again, followed much later by the United States. If you read that, uh, you will see how a very poor country uh, was made to pay France for over a century uh, to pay them back for the slaves that uh, France lost as a result of the liberation of enslaved peoples. It doesn't make sense, but it is the truth. And your question is, what do you do about, what do we do about that today? It's, there are no easy answers, but one of them is that if we, when there 
when 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 black non-European students were being prevented from leaving you, the Ukraine or and entering, I I expected that the 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 EU itself would issue a strong condemnation of racism. The EU didn't. But I have to say that I also expected that uh, the African Union itself should have made a big noise about, about it. And they, di they didn't, a little bit. But, I, but the issue is the solution belongs to partly in, in no concrete ways, but to how we find new spaces of talking about the future outside of the structured institutions who's, who are more likely to take us back to the solutions of the past than the solutions of the, of the future. So the United Nations has to be re, re, reviewed. Uh, the World Bank has to be reviewed. It makes no sense to me why we have a, a, a security council uh, with nations that have vetoing uh, powers just because they have nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, there's got to be something that makes the world look forward to then being controlled by the destructiveness of the armaments that we have. We've got to re respond to something much deeper than, than the inventions of, of destruction. And those conversations need, need to take place uh, far more today. Uh, those institutions of the world that uh, were created uh, in, after the Second World War need to be revived, and reinterpreted. They are still needed. There's no doubt in my mind, but they need to be uh, re-examined. Okay, I'm not seeing um, any questions online, but we do have um, another question in the room. Um, well, in fact, we've got several down here, but um, the gentleman in the blue shirt down here. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, ben Dean, one of the Stephen Moss School grandchildren. Um, you touched on uh, the hot topic at the moment in terms of Churchill's uh, naming of this college. We've also obviously had the Cecil Rhodes statue in Oxford, the Colston statue in Bristol. It sounded from your talk like you agree with the government policy of retain but explain more to educate people about the true history, the ups and downs of some of these people. Is that true? And are there any limits to that in your mind? Or, or are you quite firm on that view? Well, um that, that speaks directly to, to the fact that I'm the chairman of the Mandela Rhodes Foundation. And, and uh, so you cannot have uh, a, a better illustrations of two names uh, 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 together uh, that have a different view of the world. And um, I, I think it was Nelson Mandela's way. He himself, uh, 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 Wanted, wanted that name, that his name stand side by side with Rhodes. And to be a Mandela Rhodes scholar then is to be able to confront the complexities of being in the world and, and find a, a, a way not of explaining the past away, but of making the past uh, make the future better. And, and there, uh, there, uh, I'm the last person uh, uh, to say that uh, uh, statues must be destroyed. Uh, they can be placed somewhere. Uh, I, I often imagine as a, 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 a some kind of museum uh, where all the South African prime ministers. Who, uh, can be their statues can be placed there, and from time to time, when there's a, a, a an interest in the history of one of them, uh, they can be displayed for a while in public and then taken back, you know, to where. They, 
so I, I, I don't think you can wipe away history, but you need to understand it better so that you can make the future better than the present. Okay, we have time for one last question. I'm going to go to the online audience. Um, and this is from a, a Dudu D. Um, and I think it's a, it's a nice one to end on. Um, if you were Biden, what would your basic tenets of the new world order be? <laughs> if I was if I was if I was Biden, I would, I would resign from being the president of the United States, <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, if uh, change the nature, uh, at, at least in in your thinking about the future, that the, the two party system uh, in the United States uh, has not served democracy very well uh, in moments when it was it was necessary and uh, uh, right now the 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 right the rightist movements uh, have have found a, a great way uh, of uh, using the instruments of democracy to push for the 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 de-democratization of the world if if they were to achieve to win power to, to do so, uh, but I, I I think that uh, if uh, if if I were Biden, I would certainly think about how better to make the United States be a, a country free for all its citizens. I would rather that the United States was was saying to the world, look at how well we are doing in the United States. All our people have got these rights. African Americans have got these rights. The Native Americans have got. Look at how we have solved it. We are the solution, but that's not what's coming through. Okay. Well, my apologies to those of you who did have questions. Um, for those of you in the room, of course, you will have opportunities to ask them now over drinks um, and dinner. Um, I want to thank all the college teams who've made this evening possible, um, porters, catering, housekeeping. Um, it's a huge achievement, um, made even more impressive if you think that actually on Saturday night the college had its May ball. So there's been an enormous, enormous turnaround to make this evening possible. I want to thank the AV team um, for making sure that we've been heard. And of course, I want to thank the Archive Centre team for their role um, in, in organising this lecture. Um, you will see outside in the Wolfson foyer some display cases about Stephen Roskill. And when you go upstairs to the dining hall, um, there is a, a case um, um, featuring some materials from the college archive relating to yourself, Professor, including what we believe to be a grainy image of your last appearance <laughs> on this stage. Um, um, but particular thanks to my colleague Amanda um, and to Marianne in the conference office, who've really done all the hard work in, in, in pulling all of this together. Um, and with that, um, I thank you again to you for a highly personal, but also very powerful and resonant lecture, a, a triumphant return to college, and I hope one that will be repeated so that we can continue to benefit from your advice and wisdom as we continue to wrestle with these legacies and challenges that you've so eloquently described. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much.